All right, welcome back to another video. So today's video, I'm wrapping up a solar panel installation in the off-grid cabin, and I thought I'd bring you along, show you what my setup is, and talk to you a little bit about some of the problems that I have at this location. All right, so I'm gonna start with uh, the main issue with the solar panel installation here at the cabin. So you can kind of tell, it is one o'clock in the afternoon, in the middle of summer, and pretty dark up here and that's a very good thing and a very bad thing so the nice thing is when it's 90 degrees out the cabin really never gets over 75 degrees because it's located here in the woods and it's nice and shaded as you can see but shade does not lend itself to capturing the Sun and using it for electricity very well so I had very, very limited options of what I could do up here at the cabin. In the winter, when there's no leaves on the trees, I'll get a lot more sun. So I found probably the one spot that gets sun up here for most of the day. And technically that is facing, so this direction is south. So it's pretty much facing south. And you can see, I've got four 100 watt HQST panels here. And there's the one spot between the trees where they get decent sunlight. So these aren't exactly optimally placed, but they're the best that I've been able to get it up here. This is like the one spot that really gets good sun up here. So a little bit about the setup. I'm using, like I said, four 100 watt panels for a total of 400 watts. And they're HQST, they're monocrystalline. So you have two options, you have monocrystalline and polycrystalline. And without getting too much into it, the mono panels that like I have here, they're just a little bit more expensive, but the technology's come a long way and the price difference isn't really that much now, but they're a lot more efficient than the polycrystalline panels. And there's more to it than that. And I'll let you do your own research, but I decided that these would be a fairly decent budget option. So I only paid $89 a piece for these solar panels. So it was actually a pretty budget friendly option. I have a little bit more money in the stands. You could always build something to put the solar panels on. It was just easier to buy that galvanized metal uh, structure to kind of so I could put the solar panels that way the wiring was a little expensive this is outdoor rated and it's sun resistant direct bury so I can bury this if I want cable uh, it's meant for solar panels as you can see the gauge on it is extremely thick it's eight eight gauge cable because the longer the run of wire bigger gauge cable you need with especially with DC and it runs along the ground here to the back of the cabin and I have this little termination block so that keeps any kind of uh, water or anything from getting in the cabin so that's where it goes inside keeps bugs out There's our lights before we go in, take a peek. Got some baby birds right there pretending to be as still as possible, trying to disturb them. So here we are in the cabin. If you saw my previous video on the electrical system, got the same panel. You can see there's something a little bit different now. We have an outlet. Some more light on. So, kind of the meat and potatoes of the system here. Okay, so underneath here we have our main piece of the puzzle. This is a Renogy 40 amp MPPT. Uh, it's called a Rover. And now we got some light. So how this works is right here is the input from the solar panels. 
So I've got that on a circuit breaker. And I went with a 50 amp breaker because I had it. Probably 40 amp would have been a little more appropriate. But basically, it's just a quick way I can turn off power coming from the solar panels. So they come in the cabin, they come out through here. The wiring positive gets switched off right there. A negative goes in to the charge controller. Then the positive comes out of that switch and then to the input on the charge controller. Out of the rover, you have a battery output. So those are running on 10 gauge cables to the battery here. And at the battery, you can see I have another. This is a 40 amp, since that's the maximum output of the charge controller. It's a 40 amp circuit breaker. And then that is feeding into my 100 amp hour Battleborn battery at 12 volts. So ideally, you would want to have more than one of these batteries because the more batteries you have, the more capacity you have to store energy. But we aren't not up here much, and so far, uh, the one battery has been more than enough to do everything we need. And so far, it's recovered within probably about two hours in the morning when the sun comes out. The battery is up to full charge. I did get the Renogy charge control that has Bluetooth. That way you can keep an eye on what's going on. And I'll show you how that looks here in a second. But the one other thing to talk about is this charge controller has a load output terminals on it. So as long as you're not any, running anything huge, like a large inverter, you can run your output on here, which is nice because it will show you how much, how many amps or watts you're consuming on your power system without having to have an external uh, battery monitoring system. So it does have that feature built in. And I have this little 300 watt pure sine wave inverter plugged into that. Also coming on the load terminals. What's nice is I can just flip that on. I turn it off when I don't need 110 volts because it just uses a little bit of power even if you're not, don't have anything plugged in. Then I have this little extension cord that I cut off that runs up to the back of that outlet, which makes it a little more convenient. I can plug something that runs on 120 volts in right here. All right, so you can see with the multimeter leads plugged in, got about 115 volts. So that works pretty well. The key thing to remember is the maximum amount of power I can pull with that inverter is only 300 watts. So you could get a larger inverter and power something more powerful but this is only for like charging devices, smaller stuff. You wouldn't want to run like, like even a vacuum cleaner motor or anything like that. Because they can pull like 6 amps. If you take 6 times 120, that's how many watts. So like I said, we're limited to 300 watts. It's kind of a small, but it's a pure sine wave inverter. So it'll be nice to our electronics. So like from the last video, I've got lights on a dimmer mounted under here. And then in the bathroom, I have some lights, and these are all 12 volt, like out of an RV. And then up on the ceiling, I have lights running across the top of the cabin. And they do pull, at 12 volts, they pull about 2 amps, uh, all these ceiling lights when they're on at once. So it's not, it's, you know, a decent amount of power. There's a lot of light in here though. But I do have this wireless dimmer. So I can kind of turn the lights down. And by using this wireless switch, it made so I didn't have to run wiring all the way across the cabin. I could kind of keep everything contained right here. All right, so I'll take a minute to show you the app on the phone from Renogy. And just a disclaimer, I, didn't, I paid full price for the charge controller. Um, so far, I like how it works. I have a Victron controller that I'm going to use in another project. I think I like it a little bit better and how it uh, displays the information. Uh, the Renogy one, it's okay. The app, sometimes I have to kind of like force close it. But So you can have multiple controllers here. 
If I go in, it kind of shows this little animation. Shows that basically that everything's working. Now here's where it shows our uh, solar panels. It says there's 84.5 volts on them right now. It says 0.72 amps and 61 watts. So out of 400 watts of solar panels, I'm only getting 60 watts right now. So charging voltage is 14.3 volts and it's charging at 4 amps. And then right now my load is 3.45 amps. That's how much is being used. That's with that inverter just turned on and the, all these lights in here turned on. So I am um, barely, as you can see, I'm pulling 3.4 amps and I'm bringing in 4.04 amps. So I'm just ahead of the curve right now. I'm not depleting the battery, I'm slightly charging it. So that's important that you, you know, kind of plan out your system and understand how much power you're gonna be using. So if you had like a, a refrigerator or something constantly running, uh, you'd be constantly draining. If you're draining faster than you can charge, and then you gotta take into account at night when there's no sun, that's kind of how you, fig you figure out how much power you need. So we really, you know, being in the shade up here, it's kind of really hurting what 400 watts of solar can normally do. Normally 400 watts would be quite a bit for a small cabin or an RV. But as you can see, I'm only getting about 60 watts right now. And there's slightly different ways to hook up the panels. Uh, you can hook them up in a series and you'd have a higher amperage coming in. I have them hooked up, or see so you have them hooked up in parallel and you have higher amps coming in. I have them hooked up in a series, which means it's adding like it's like putting them together they're like 20 volt 22 volt panels so it's adding all the voltage together which is a lower amps higher volts and the mpp charge controller can take advantage of the higher voltage and then it breaks it down into the 14 volts at a higher amps so like i said it's charging at four amps even though it's only bringing in 0.69 amps and that is the advantage of using an MPP charge controller, which like I said, it's a little more expensive than the pulse width modulation, the old ones. Um, but you also can't run it like this. It's a lot more efficient. So just like the monocrystalline versus the polycrystalline, MPPT versus PWM, you spend a little bit more money and you're gonna get a lot more efficiency out of the system. But if I click history, I've only had the system up and running for a few days here, but it'll show you that so so far my max charging power, if you can read that, has been 274 watts at once. And that's useful because so again, I have 400 watts solar, worth of solar panels and the maximum in the amount of sun that I can get up here has been 274 watts. That's pulled in at once. So obviously not ideal. It's why I went with twice as many solar panels as I calculated I needed. So ideally I would only needed about 200 watts worth of solar panels in this cabin for what we do here. So that's why I went with double, with four instead of two solar panels. That way I would be able to get more watts with less sun, if that makes sense. So overall, I'm happy with it. Not a whole lot of money invested into this so far, and I'll be sure to put links in the description for the stuff I used in case you would like to purchase something similar. So one more thing, you can set uh, some different parameters on here. Um, it does, you, do, you can control the load from the app. So for instance, if I hit this button here, I just cut off all the power going out of the charge controller, and it turns off the power. Basically, it just shuts the battery down, which is nice. All right, so one other thing to consider when putting together your solar array. Obviously, as I mentioned, depending on the type of charge controller, whether it's a pulse width modulation or an MPPT, um, it kind of determines whether you run your series or parallel solar panels. So I started out with these all in a series, which, for example, if they were each a 20 volt solar panel, when we add all four of them together, like a battery in series, that makes 
about 80 volts and it's higher than 80 volts. It's almost 90 volts when it's all combined in full sun. So the best scenario is that they are all in the sun and they're outputting that high voltage and a lower amperage. And then that MPPT controller is turning that into something that the battery can use and that your load demands. Another way to do it, which is what I'm going to switch to now to try out is during parts of the day, one side or the other is slightly in the shade. And unfortunately, when you have them wired in series, if any bit of the solar panels is in the shade, it will actually knock down the performance of the ones that are even in the sun. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split the array in half. So the left side, that these two will be in a series with each other, and these two will be in a series with each other. And then I will parallel them by using these little adapters right here. So it basically makes it so you can plug two solar panels in together with one output. And what that does is, instead of having, in my example, the 80 volts of the four of them combined, it will be 40 volts coming in on the wires to the cabin, but it will be double the amperage. So instead of, it, like I said, if it was two amps, or just hypothetically speaking, it will be 40 volts at four amps instead of 80 volts at two amps. And it all works out about the same when it gets to the charge controller. It's just taking advantage of the technology in the solar panels. And if part of it is partially shaded, we'll still be able to get the maximum amount of energy we can without wasting any of it. All right, so like I showed before, for your complete series connection, we had our negative one side, the positive was all the way on the other side connected. And then all the panels were kind of chained together. Here we're breaking the connection between the left and the right side. So here's our positive and our negative. And then they are hooked together in the middle. And over here is our negative and our positive. So what we want to do is bring the two positives as close as we can together so we can plug it in here. And then we'll plug this into this line here. And we'll bring both of our negatives together and run them into here. All right, so there's what it looks like plugged in. All right, so I got it hooked back up. Uh, now, obviously, the sun is setting and there's no sun on the panels. It's not a good time to look, but see, we're down to 16 volts, 0.68 amps. We're only pulling 14 watts of solar panel or solar power right now. And our load is 3.06 amps right now. But again, as soon as the sun comes out in the morning, this is all gonna jump right back up. And there has not been a day yet here in the cabin. And we don't have a whole lot going on in here. But the other day I was doing some work and was running the water pump quite a bit, the 12 volt water pump and a radio and a fan and it didn't put a dent in all of, in the power. In fact, the solar panels were producing more power than I was using the entire time. So it didn't use the battery at all. So the reason I chose to put the solar panels on the ground and not on the roof is because again, the roof doesn't get any sun most of the day. You can see here's this side of the roof. And the only spot with any sun is just that one little tiny bit there. So that wouldn't do me any good. And also, in the winter, uh, if it snows and you have solar panels on the roof, you see, same thing on this side, just a little bit of sun on the back over there. But in the winter, the snow covers the solar panels and makes them so they don't work. It's much easier to get the snow off if they're down here on the ground. And I can keep an eye on them and take care of them better. So if you can put your solar panels down lower, it's actually easier for you to keep an eye on them, take care of them and clean them than if they're on your roof and get the snow off. So just something to think about. All right, so that wraps it up for today. Uh, if you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comment section below. Be sure to like the video if it helped you out, subscribe for more. And until next time, we'll see you later.